All right, let's solve this very interesting question. This is on the concept of probability. So you need a strong hold on the concept. Besides that, you really need to properly understand everything that's given to you. Only then will you be able to answer what is asked. So we'll work on owning this data set. Let's start reading this. The situation is that Desmond is designing a certain game. And when he is designing this game, he noticed something. What did he notice? He noticed probability of a fair coin landing face up exactly two times when the coin is tossed three times is equal to and then there's another probability. First just notice how this entire yellow thing is a very complicated way of simply saying that I'm talking about the probability that the coin lands face up two out of three times. So you tossed it a total of three times and two out of that it came face up and it's a fair coin. What does that tell you? It tells you that the coin will either come up or come down face up face down with an equal probability which means both of them will have an individual probability of one by two. That's another thing we got here. Now then it talks about another probability which is equal to this first probability. So let's read this second probability. Also this is about a fair coin landing face up exactly m times when it is tossed n times. Again, a more complicated way of simply saying the probability of coming up m out of n times. So that's a simpler way of saying this. Now, it also adds that n is greater than 3. Why is it doing that? Well, just to help you distinguish between these two scenarios, this is where it was a total of three tosses and two out of them came face up. Now, if n were also three, then m, one m, that would definitely work is two because we're saying the probabilities are equal. So, well, if m and n were simply two and three, we would be done. It would obviously work. But they wanted us to understand that this is a different scenario. Okay, so we'll see what this means. We will write down our probability expressions. We will put them equal then, and then we'll see what all we can find. But before going too deep into the work, we should give a glance at what the question is asking so that we only do as much as is needed. Okay, so here is your question. It says select for M and for N the values consistent with the information. So it's the M and N that we just saw in the question. All of this mentioned. This M and N is what we need to find. Now then we really will work on the probability information and see what we can find. First, let me only try to write this first probability. What is the probability of a fair coin landing face up two out of three times? Let's only think about this. We are saying that there are a total of three tosses and two out of them were face up. So if I denote it this way, U, U and D, what is the probability of something like this happening? Now, if I simply write probability of the first one being U is half, second one is half and the third one being D is also half, simply using this part, then I will be wrong. I'm not completely done everything here. If I just say one by eight because of this, I am missing a lot of cases. What are those cases? Well, in just simply writing in this way and then finding the probability, I've assumed that the first one is up, second one is up and the third one is down, which I know nothing about, nor does my probability here mention anything like this. It says two out of three times. So if it's two out of three times, it can be any two out of three times. And for all of those, though, probability will come the same. That means I also need to factor in how many ways can something like this happen? In how many ways can I have three tosses such that two of them come face up and one face down? Simply think about it as a three letter word where I need to choose which ones are going to be you. Simply think about this as three empty places that I have to fill and I have to choose which ones are going to be U, automatically the last one will be D. So out of these three places, I'm going to choose two places for the use. So this, when you calculate, you'll see this can be done in three ways. And the probability from here, which was one by eight, when you multiply, you get that this probability, the first one that you're talking about is three by eight. Very, very important to take care of this and not assume the order in which the ups and the downs come. So this is the first probability. If you found the analysis analysis of this data set helpful, then hit that like button so that other GMAT aspirants can also learn from it. And to stay tuned with such content, hit the subscribe button below. Now, to take your learning to the next level, we have put together a free trial in which you can experience content in all the sections tested on GMAT Focus Edition. For example, you can build your CR pre-thinking skills, you can learn how to approach statistics questions in graphics interpretation as part of DI, you can learn everything about linear inequalities as tested on the GMAT Focus Edition and a lot of other content. The link for this is in the description. Now, let's get back to the question at hand. Now, once you've understood this, the second one will be really simple for you. Why? Because it's exactly the same structure. It's just that this time I have a total of n events here, n different tosses of my coin. Again, m out of those are u's. So, 
I will write it this way. This is m times the u's, the ups, and all of the others are going to be downs. So again, out of a total of n tosses, I have to choose the m tosses in which I will get a face up. Once I do that, I have taken care of this part in my second situation. But now, when I really multiply this by the probability, notice how it was simply just 1 by 2, 1 by 2, all three times. So here also, it is going to be 1 by 2, 1 by 2 only for all n tosses. This then, when I write it in a simpler way, it's ncm over 2 to the power n. This is the probability that represents the second one here. Now, important thing here that they gave was that this n is greater than 3. Okay, so we'll just keep it here. Now, these are the two probabilities which are equal. So if I put them into an equation, the left side, obviously, I have a clean number. The right side, I have two unknowns. I have n and m. Now, trying to simply solve such an equation will be time consuming. I don't even know if I can because it's two unknowns. So I will see what the choices are giving me and I'll take hint from there. So let's go there now. And here we are, and this is the equation we got. Now look, first thing they told me was that this n is greater than 3. What that helps me do is that I can already reject all of these possibilities for n. I don't even have to think about this. If somebody is not very careful, they would just feel, okay, the left side of this I got by taking n equal to 3 and m equal to 2, so I can simply mark m equal to 2 and n 3. They would be wrong because they would have missed this constraint. Now then, I have only these three possibilities for n. So what we can simply do is we will put in different values of n and try to see if there's a corresponding m that works for us. At this point, let me ask you this. Could you have arrived at the approach of solving this question with this level of clarity had you not spent the effort in thoroughly understanding the information presented? Such is the power of the process of owning the data set. And because this skill may not come naturally to many of you, we have created a course architecture that ensures that we teach you this skill through every guided quiz in the EGMAT DI course and we reinforce the same in every practice quiz. In fact, in the TPA quant modules in the two-part analysis course, we teach you how to get comfortable with this question type. You will gain the confidence to handle any question of this type in the most efficient manner. We serve more than 58 specially curated questions at the right progression so that you can learn various aspects of this question type, including the process skills of inference, translate and visualize. Thus, throughout the DI course, through around 500 questions, you will learn such process skills so that you can also comfortably use the owning the data set approach. Let's now get back to the solution at hand. So if I take n equal to 4, which is the first one that comes after 3, then my left side is 3 by 8 only. My right side is equal to 4cm over 2 to the power 4. Now then we'll see which value of m here works, if any, for n equal to 4. So basically, I'm getting into subcases now. I'll take m equal to 1. So I want to see if 4c1 upon 2 to the power 4, if this thing really can be equal to 3 by 8. Now without doing any further work, I know 4c1 is 4 and 2 to the power 4 is only going to have 2s. So what my value of interest was, it was a 3 by 8. I needed a 3 somewhere. Neither my numerator nor my denominator has a factor of 3. So this one cannot be it. Now, it's easy to actually find this also, but when there are so many values to check, you have to be smart about how far you go in your checking. Then, if you check for m equal to 2, you just see, is my 4c2 over 2 to the power 4, is this something that can work? When I write the expression for 4c2, it's 4 factorial over 2 factorial, 2 factorial, and this is my 2 to the power 4. Let's just think if I can get that 3, because I have so many 2s, I have a feeling that the 8 will not be a problem. So, see, when you try to simplify this factorial, because 4 factorial is greater than 2 factorial, you will simplify this further. You will split this into 4 times 3 factorial or 4 into 3 times 2 factorial. Now you see a 3 factor has entered into the picture. Because there is no 3 in the denominator, this is going to stay. And now because I think this will work, we will take this further to see if it really does work and it perfectly does. It does come out to be 3 by 8 and so I have found a value of m that works with this value of n. So we found a pair that works which means we do not need to check any further. Understand how important this inference-based calculation is when you have so many choices to look at. Think about what would happen if n equal to 4 would not work. You would then have to think about n equal to 5, then about n equal to 6 with all of these values of m. In those cases, such inferences make you a very powerful solver and you don't just get into mindless calculations. Okay, let's summarize this now. So we began by understanding everything that was given, both of the probabilities that were mentioned. We carefully considered the first case because once this was clear, just extending it onto the second case was 
was simple. Okay, so here when we found the probabilities for both of them, we saw that the question wanted m and n, and our only guide for that would be this one equation. Then we did not try to solve this equation because it's not one of the simplest ones. You have a combination here. If you really did open it up, you would have an n factorial, m factorial. You would have factorials and exponents in a single equation. Much e easier than that is to go into plugging in, but that too doing in a smart way so that you only do as much as is needed. So after you understand your data set, even while you're trying to find the final answer, it's super important that you don't overdo things. Okay, that's it.